All right. So, hi, my name's Trevor, Trevor Popple. This is, um, well, otherwise, I'm otherwise known as the Wealthy Warlock. I'm here with William Brown today. Uh, William Brown is a biophysicist investigating the physics operational at the cellular and molecular level of the biological system. He presents lectures and talks and Q&A forums to teach the syncretic theories of unified science. He is a part of the research team at the International Space Federation, a research and development company generating novel technologies in geometrodynamic and quantum vacuum engineering for harnessing energy from the zero point field and gravity control for propulsion. As well, William has applied discoveries from his biophysics research to technologies that can be utilized for greater health and system coherence which made me very quickly think I was, um, of course, I've got my art crystal on uh, that I use all the time for structuring my water. But was there anything else that you've applied your um, research to in terms of technology? Yes, yeah. So we, uh, well, th thank you uh, for that uh, introduction there, uh, Trevor, and uh, it's great to be uh, joining you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we uh, have a, a patent uh, that is uh, in uh, preparation uh, th uh, that uh, a prophetic patent that uh, is looking at the uh, application of the same kind of uh, systems coherence, increasing systems coherence via the structured field uh, yeah. that is a, a, a application to potentially, we believe, uh, increase the uh, functional efficiency of the molecular motors and the mitochondria. Uh, so within every cell of your body, uh, you have hundreds, in some cases, thousands of these subcellular organelles called uh, mitochondria. Uh, and one of the things that the mitochondria do, well, they do a myriad of things. They're, they're really one of the most fascinating <laughs> things to, to uh, yeah. investigate uh, and consider in, in terms of the biological organization. Uh, they're, they're the, the, the information and energy production centers of the cell, yeah. uh, they, they probably are responsible for uh, the higher level consciousness, awareness of, of uh, cells and our, hence ourselves yeah. at a gestalt level. Uh, but Oh, I'm sorry, just one moment. Um, I'm getting uh, this beeping. Uh, I, is my volume coming through clearly, like yep. uninterrupted? Yep. Okay, yep. all right. Your screen dragged. For okay, I just, yeah, it's okay now. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, my computer is just uh, sending this continuous beeping. <laughs> okay, so I'll, it's all good. Uh, but so the, uh, within the <laughs> mitochondria, though, uh, I mean, you, you've got some extremely interesting dynamics you've got some high energy physics taking place yes. uh, because one of the things that the mitochondria is doing is engineering matter at a subatomic level mm -hmm. so within your cell and at the subcellular level you've got these hyper intelligent systems that are separating protons and electrons uh, from molecules yeah. and embedded in this inner membrane, uh, they're, they're dual membrane uh, uh, organelles uh, that actually have a, cyst, a structure that's fairly reminiscent of what we described for the proton internal structure, which is an interesting thing, uh, similarity there. Uh, but within this internal membrane, they have a, a, a insulated wire, you can almost think of it, an insulated protein wire where they're conducting electrons through the membrane, uh, they're conducting these electrons with almost superconductor-like efficiency, almost 100% efficiency, and then they're form they're uh, shuttling protons. So they're separating electrons and protons from matter. They're shuttling the protons into this luminal space, this intermembrane space. So they build up this proton plasma essentially. Uh, and if you look at the electrical charge in this region within the mitochondria, uh, it's producing an electrical gradient uh, that 
it's a hundred about 130 180 millivolts in, in this region but what, that's like uh, uh an at the nanoscale you know a, a billionth of a meter if you take that voltage that's being generated in these mitochondria and you expand it to the macro scale so you know we're, we're at scales of about a meter it that the charge buildup that's being generated in the mitochondria is would be the equivalent of 30 million volts per square meter. Holy crap. Uh, at, so at the macro scale, uh, it's the strength of a bolt of lightning. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, a, a extremely high energy uh, dynamics are occurring uh, at this subcellular level. That's huge. Uh, yeah I mean, so, so well, um you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so so you know it's only because so if if you took 30 million volts per square meter yeah. and you looked at a, a, a nanometer square region it's like 180 millivolts but you could also do the converse to that uh in that so you have thousands of mitochondria in every cell uh, they have a tremendous amount of surface area because like the, the sulky and gyria, the cortex of your brain, that folded region yes. of the cortex of your brain, mitochondria do the same thing yes. to increase surface area. So they have a tremendous amount of surface area. Yes. Uh, if you took all the surface area of all the mitochondria, it would be four football pitches worth, like four football fields worth of, of uh, uh, surface area. In you, uh, so, so you, your mitochondria would cover four football fields uh, of uh, surface. Uh, now you take it, okay, so the surface area in the mitochondria has 30 million volts per square meter. You're talking about hundreds of trillions of volts of energy uh, that, that is collectively within the mitochondria. So, you know, we're actually talking about a very high energy system yeah. you, you know so uh, pe people you know the, they think about biology they think it's it's wet it's noisy and it's like low energy like sluggish electrons moving from oh, one cell to the next if they're thinking about electrons moving at all yeah. uh but you know as a biophysicist i can tell you that's not the case we're, we're talking about a high energy system that is uh you could almost say technologically sophisticated in that it's manipulating matter at the subatomic level. Yeah. Uh, so we, so uh, we, we do have a patent that looks at ways to augment that area. Uh, so uh, using a uh, structured electromagnetic field, uh, if it would be possible uh, to couple with some of the dynamics, because you've got plasma dynamics. So you've got plasma modes, uh, uh, you've, you've got vibrational modes that, that have particular resonances. Uh, you have uh, the ATP synthase in there that is spinning its, uh, as fast as 60,000 revolutions per minute, 1,000 revolutions per second. These spinning motors embedded in those membranes, resonance, frequency, vibration, it's potential, uh, we could potentially couple to that. And, and uh, so one of the things that you know, we're applying our research into looking at is coupling to that, increasing the efficiency, uh, modulating it perhaps even for uh, rejuvenation of the system uh, so that you rejuvenate life at its core element yeah. in the mitochondria. Yeah. Uh, you could potentially have some very significant life extension and uh, boost to health, significant boost to health. <laughs> potentially I can, I can see that and it would be something that even me as a lay person would say i'd be expecting that <laughs> uh, uh, yeah and, yeah wow yeah i really want to keep asking you questions yeah. about um the mitochondria especially about how it's extracting and separating the electrons from the proton and how it manages those high energy um dynamics that we've got there but we're detracting from the purpose that we've got here, which is this amazing piece of work that you've got here. Now, for anybody who hasn't seen it, I'll provide a link in the video, uh, whether we're on YouTube, you'll see it in the description or on the website, whatever, it'll be there. But uh, William has a paper that he's released on, I'm not sure of the pronunciation on the website, Kios? Uh, chaos. 
chaos. Yeah, so it's got it's got a interesting spelling. Yeah, uh, that's not normally how you, how you spell chaos, right? Uh, but yeah, the pronunciation is, is chaos. Hence why I'm going to uh, provide everybody a link because if I spell it out, yeah. you, <laughs> you'll be like, "What?" and you'll have to replay again and again. <laughs> Um, and it's not spelled C H A O S. It's, it's it's got a a, a Greek spelling uh, because you know in, in science uh, everything is converted to like Greek yes. letters. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, the provisional definition of the living state that is a dele delineation of an empirical criterion that defines a system as a life. That is the name of the paper that you've got. Like I said, I'll pop the website up there for everybody to find it. And you've also got a couple of other papers there I noticed as well that I'm going to look at very soon. But um, this one was a big one for me because I was under the assumption that the Turing test was actually a decent test. To be honest, I've never actually looked into what the Turing test was. I'd only ever heard of it referenced in media, science fiction media and stuff like that. So when I looked into it, I was quite flabbergasted about the... Um, lack of science <laughs> behind the Turing test, despite the fact that it's meant to be a scientific test, right? Um, would you like to describe what your opinion is with the floor of the Turing test is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, that's that's just awesome that, that uh, you picked up on that kind of key element because, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting situation where this thought experiment which is really what the turing test uh it comes from not from like a rigorous science i would say yeah. so it's more like a, a thought experiment uh you know it, it's coming from looking at uh an analysis of machine intelligence and you know when could we say that machine intelligence is lifelike uh it's an interesting development though that actually in that kind of consideration, in a thought experiment around that, uh, it, it actually leads you to uh, a definition for what life is. Uh, you know, so so that's kind of uh, I, I find it a very interesting parallel there, a, a very interesting actually not even parallel, a very interesting convergence uh, in, in this uh, because, and so the the study. Uh, on, the preliminary definition for uh, life, a preliminary criterion to define life, uh, actually does uh, bring into play, br bring into consideration things like artificial intelligence, yeah. uh, synthetic intelligence, s synthetic biology, synthetic uh, organisms, these, these kind of uh, ideas, uh, and you know, that becomes very important in uh, considerations of how we define what a living system is, how we define what to be alive is. Uh, now, with the Turing test, uh, uh, for me, it, it's almost like a lazy solution, uh, a, a lazy definition for, for how we uh, define consciousness. I've, I find it uh, very underwhelming uh, on its solution, but I mean, it's taken as like the standard. I mean, it's, it's what is referenced uh, yeah. when we're talking about like artificial general intelligence, uh, AGI. So when our, you know, burge burgeoning artificial intelligence systems, wh when do they become conscious? How would we know? Uh, invariably, if there's a discussion around that, it, it goes to, you'll hear mention of the Turing test. And essentially what it is, is that, uh, well, if you have one of these artificial intelligence, a machine intelligence, uh, and you have, let's say, in like a black box type situation, like in a, a separate room, and you have a person that's communicating with it remotely, a human person, uh, which is more, usually that's what a, a persons are. But, you know, we're starting to talk about non-human agents here. But so just to make clear, a hu human person that's, uh, let's say, communicating with it remotely. So, you know, maybe via like a, a chat prompt type situation uh the, you know the idea is that if that human is unable to say 
uh, definitively whether they're talking with another person or with a machine intelligence, then that machine intelligence is conscious. That's the criterion That's uh, from the Turing test. Now, there's some major flaws uh, oh, yeah. with that. And actually, we can see it now, the, yeah. the, the uh, errors in using that as a, a defining criterion for saying that something is conscious, uh, because it's actually not that difficult. Um, I mean, in the scheme of how difficult things can be, like, let's say the difficulty of constructing the human brain. Yeah, very difficult. <laughs> well, I, I imagine it would also have a big um, indication as to who you're trying to convince as well, like the broad spectrum of how a human relates to their environment says that the person up here is going to be really hard to convince and the person down here <laughs> well, uh, I'll uh, believe anything yeah. you tell them, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, th th yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th 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 there's no rigor in it, right? Because uh, no, no standardization. Because, no uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, you know, my grandparents uh, used to think they were talking to a real person when they'd get a automated, <laughs> you, you know, yeah. uh, uh, response yep. when they called like uh, uh, you know a phone company, and it'd be the the automated response they. Think they're talking to a real person you know so yeah so uh, the, the, there's you know no rigor or standardization because yeah. if uh, if your criterion is a person is fooled well there's a range uh you know on, on you know some days i might be fooled <laughs> by, uh, by an ai you know uh because especially they're, they're getting good right I, I started in a little bit of programming you know back a late 90s kind of term of era but um <laughs> yeah the, the programmers can be very tricky people and they can be very cunning as well <laughs> so in order for them to fool your average person yeah that's very unscientific in in my simple opinion anyway so this this is desperately needed right now like you said especially with ai coming up right up to the surface where we are right now bubbling at the at the reams so to speak yeah, it's definitely needed. You know, I, I, I think it's it's pertinent right now. I mean, yeah. uh, the, there is questions right now about whether some of these uh, large language model systems that have been developed are indeed conscious. Uh, I mean, some of the w developers, pe people who have been working directly with them, have said they believe they are. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, actually, one of the Google engineers got fired for saying that he thinks that their AI system is, is conscious, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, but, you know, one of the things that it highlights, though, uh, is what is uh, the philosophy behind what consciousness is? Uh, but even more significantly, what is uh, our scientific model for what consciousness is? Yeah. Uh, and so the reason why the Turing test is accepted as the orthodox uh, test for if a artificial system is conscious uh, is that within the mainstream scientific purview, consciousness is machine programming. Uh, so exactly. if a machine program can mimic consciousness to such a degree that most people can't tell the difference, it is conscious. Uh, and a lot of researchers will have no problem with that uh, because they see no qu difference qualitatively or even fundamentally between uh, programming a, 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 a program, an algorithm in machine intelligence that mimics consciousness and biological programming and a biological machine that mimics consciousness. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, essentially consciousness is not a real thing in yeah. the orthodox perspective. Exactly. It's not even um, it's put so beautifully at one point, it's not even looked at or discussed as a potential. In, in one point you mentioned there from from your general purview um but this is like, uh, like i said this is a very interesting point in time not only just because of the ai but 
I uh, also do a little bit of law study. There's a uh, person in law also includes companies, associations, registered bodies, corporate entities, government entities, and other things like this. So the, these, these are interesting ideas because some of them, like if we take the medical industry itself, an industry gets to a point where it's almost got its own consciousness about it, you know, that there's a larger intelligence around this entire field of working energy that is moving about these systems. And at a certain point, it seems to start having a life force of its own almost, you know. Absolutely. So person and intelligence and living systems and consciousness goes far beyond our limitations of physical matter, clearly. And that's obviously going to be a limitation in the standard model of physics because that's where reality ends, apparently. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, but you know that's that's a great point that you make there uh, because um, you know you, you can see in, in our work when we're talking about um, hollow fractal physics yeah. uh, and uh, hollow fractal organization of systems in the universe that I, and even uh, in, in other prominent researchers work like uh, Dr. Mike Levin uh, is a really phenomenal research researcher in this area uh, that all agents, all entities, our consciousnesses are actually collective consciousnesses. Exactly. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, actually made from uh, in like a hierarchical fashion of uh, lower level independent consciousnesses that come together and form a collective uh so you know we're um just around all. a just all exactly yeah i mean so we're around 80 to 100 million cells mm -hmm. uh any one of which with just a few tweaks can become its own entity uh with its own kind of goal set uh and its own drives and motivations we call that cancer uh <laughs> I was always you know, the same, but yes good it, so right. but you see it at every level of organization uh yeah. so our cells are actually made up of uh independent agents yeah or agents that at one time were independent but now are codependent the mitochondria uh and, and so you, you know you have this fractal organization at, 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 at almost all scales you, you have that same organization at the uh, super organism scale, humans come together and form collective consciousnesses. And you can call those corporations, uh, e even like, uh, you know, societies, yeah. cities, you, you, th those have a kind of uh, a transcendent level consciousness. Uh, they, they, culture they form is a perfect example. Yeah. What, what's that? Culture is a perfect example. Oh, culture. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, culture even forms memes. Yes. You know, me memes are yeah. genes. It, it derives from genes, you know, uh, uh, you know, cultural memory that is passed on. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a meme. Uh, so it's like, yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, the um, uh, uh, fractal organization occurs at, at all scales. So you definitely can't talk about the consciousness of a corporation. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah, that, that has an interesting uh, uh, implications for law. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things that go on in that world. Enough of that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there was one thing I wanted to bring into conversation here, which I, I read and thought was beautiful that I just had to quote it from your paper here. Um, on if you just take it as a PDF and print it out, it's, it's about page five. Uh, at the top of that, it starts with in the concluding discussion of his book, Schrodinger speculated on the nature of determinism, free will and consciousness and proffered the inference that I, as in I in the widest meaning of the word, that is to say, every conscious mind that has ever said or felt I, and I like that little addition, that I am the person, if any, who controls the motion of the atoms according to the laws of nature. I was blown away by that, that quote from Schrodinger there. But you go on to illustrate here that there's two salient points. That one, the state of matter that we call living has at least verifiably in some instances a quality of sentience and awareness. I think most people would agree with that. 
And number two, the sentience and awareness animates matter and controls the motion of atoms, which could be interpreted as an indication of the fundamental and even potential intrinsic nature of the basal awareness, which was point number three I was going to bring up. But that I wanted to talk about for a second because I find myself constantly trying to talk to people how they think that they're kind of at the pilot of their own life, but they don't have as much control as they seem to think they do. And I usually use the body as an example of that, how we move our arm, how we breathe, how we function on a day to day basis, except we don't. We kind of imagine that we do and then our body does what we issue it commands to do and our biology follows the orders that we give it. We're not actually in there working all the parts and the pieces and moving it all about ourselves, that there's a, a way in which we order about the movement of the atoms according to the laws of nature just like you said, or Schrodinger said. So here we have a really beautiful point of bringing into the actual focus of the paper, which is the measurement of what we can define as alive and something that has an intrinsic sentience or an awareness about it. You mentioned that a few times in the paper and it's hard to Put your finger on and kind of identify it and that's it slightly further on from that william goes on from merriam webster and lists off all of their definitions on what uh a living or what what to be alive is and there's some 17 odd definitions for it you know and different characteristics that are listed there but without spoiling the entire paper What's missing from that list is the most empirical part of, an in, of, a, of a living system, which is that it seems to have this intrinsic aspect coming out of it. And you do touch on the similarities between how the neurocomputational model, while not thinking that there's an intrinsic substance to the universe, views the input of the parents and the culture as the programming code input that then fires up and allows the system to manage itself. But that's why having the idea that the baby is a clean slate as soon as it comes out from the womb, mm -hmm. that it doesn't learn while it's in the womb or that it's not learning before it's inseminated while it's still within the mother's and the grandmother's womb as a, as a template for an egg even. So all of these points that we can see are uh, having an influence on the construction and the reality of the human being obviously have an impact on what the human being does or how they become. They are parts of the code, but we can clearly see that there's something else that's coming out of the individual unit. Is that correct? Am I getting the gist of the paper here to a nutshell? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're definitely uh, um, on point with the, the, the main uh, uh, gist of the paper, uh, because, you know, you're, you're identifying that, uh, you know, oftentimes when we're talking about uh, consciousness and, uh, you know, what defines uh, the personality or even uh, what the life of a person uh, is oftentimes identified with programming. Yes. Uh, there's the genetic programming uh, or even uh, programming coming from the parents. And uh, uh, the main criteria that is outlined in that paper, that's defined in that paper uh, for what makes a organization of matter and energy alive uh, is that it defies programming. It's beyond yes. programming. It's something that is not programmed. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, it's also something that's not coming from outside influence. It's something that is uh, internally held by the system and comes uh, through it and out. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the consciousness that makes a system alive, uh, that makes the system identifiable as a living system, as alive, uh, that consciousness uh, is not the result of like a set algorithm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, that, that 
awareness, uh, that volition of the system. So the, the, the awareness is observable via volition. So uh, goal-oriented behavior, goal that you can see the system has objectives, uh, has goals that, that uh, pertain to its identity as a, uh, a delineable system. Can I just interject for one second? The word volition, I had to do a quick search on to find out um, what some uh, inferences of that word are. And it, volition has about it a characteristic of a goal orientated objective coming from within as opposed to outward. Yeah. So if you've got a dirty environment and a robot is cleaning that environment, that's not exactly volition. Exactly. Exactly. It's an external yeah. task. So it's more yeah. like what humans do when they create art as opposed to what we do when we're at work. So exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 And you know, I offer a little bit of a uh, uh, further clarification on it. Uh, Stand alone volition. Yes. Uh, because I believe you could program, let's say, a robot uh, cleaning uh, to, to have an actual veritable volition to want to clean. Yes. <laughs> you could program that in. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. Now, the distinction that is important uh, uh, that I'm uh, uh, claiming here is that the kind of volition that defines an awareness and uh, a true living system uh, is even deeper than that. It's not a volition that can be programmed. It's a standalone volition, i.e. non-programmable volition. Uh, and it, it arises from the intrinsic awareness of the system. It doesn't arise from an algorithm. Uh, or a set of natural laws, uh, deterministic Newtonian mechanics. It doesn't arise from those things, which is normally how we say, especially within the mainstream or orthodox approach of like the neural computational model of, con uh, of consciousness, uh, that, you know, it arises from programming or deterministic laws of physics or mm -hmm. some such uh, uh, essentially algorithm uh it, it's beyond that deeper than that uh so you know th that's uh so so, so that that is the defining criterion yeah. is that uh, a system is alive uh if it exhibits goal-oriented behavior that is standalone volition so you can run a series of tests so this is where we get beyond the Turing test. Yeah. Run a series of tests that challenge, let's say, challenge the the, the system, uh, so that you know it has a goal that it's working towards. You obstruct it. You see it, intelligent behavior. It finds a way around that to still get to the goal, and you can run a series of tests such that you rule out that there's no way that this behavior could have been the result of programming. It's a standalone volition. Standalone volition only comes from intrinsic awareness. Mm. The system has intrinsic awareness. It is alive. It is a living uh, system. So that that is the, the defining criterion. Now, there's a little bit of uh, physics that's mixed in with that, uh, that, that is part of that, uh, because one of the things is that you will only see that exhibited, that goal-oriented behavior that is standalone volition that only comes from awareness, uh, you'll only see that exhibited, animated, uh, if the system is uh, in what's called far from thermodynamic equilibrium. I wanted to uh, talk a bit about that. What, what, what do you mean by far from equilibrium? And for everybody out there, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, when you're uh, t talking about uh, the th thermodynamics. So we're go going back to, to uh, physics here. Yes. Uh, and and th th this, I uh, should uh, tie in a little bit of, of what Schrodinger was saying there at some point, because uh, it's a really important point uh, that Schrodinger was making there. Uh, but uh, now th th there's the intrinsic awareness. Uh, now, 
where we're saying that intrinsic awareness comes from, we're saying that it's intrinsic. <laughs> so it, it is a fundamental aspect of universal organization. Uh, so that is oftentimes philosophically called uh, panpsychism. We use the terminology, I use the terminology of uh, pan proto psychism, uh, just to uh, kind of qualify what the awareness is. Now, we say that that awareness, that intrinsic awareness that is universal, uh, is in all things uh, because it comes from the unified field. Mm. Uh, what what is a unified field? Uh, the unified field is the quantum vacuum energy density of the uh, uh, electromagnetic field that is coupled to gravitational geometry, gravitational curvature, uh, so that the two are one and the same uh, unified field. So electromagnetism and s space time geometry are one and the same thing, but uh, the dynamics that are occurring there are occurring in all systems. It's actually how you get matter and materiality. You get it out, out of this this field. Uh, if you look at the structure of this field uh, at the microscopic, at the quantum scale, it is a far from thermodynamic equilibrium system. <laughs> uh, so when the field uh, has an arrangement such that there is a gradient, uh, so, because the field is, is an energy density of quantum vacuum fluctuations, uh, when you have a gradient uh, in that energy density, uh, you have a energy and information flux, uh, and you that is identified as matter. Uh, that when you have that gradient, that far from thermodynamic equilibrium phase in the vacuum structure, that's matter. So that's what makes up materiality. Uh, okay. The same kind of energy and information flux that's occurring there, that is collectively what is producing pan-proto-psychism, uh, a, a global universal intrinsic awareness. So it, it's in all things. So, you know, what that would mean, though, is that, well, so uh, awareness is in all things, so all things are alive and living? In a certain sense, yes. <laughs> Uh, in, in a certain sense, uh, the, the universe is alive. Uh, the, the, you could almost make the argument that the universe fits the definition for a living system. But uh, there are some distinctions uh, because it, and the distinctions arise with scale. Uh, so we have to consider what scale we're talking about. And the scale is relevant because as humans, as uh, agents, uh, us, uh, us entities, we occupy a very specific scale. Yeah. Uh, it's actually kind of the meso scale because we're about 10 to 30 orders of magnitude uh, difference between the size of the universe diameter. Uh, the observable universe is about 10 to 30 orders of magnitude larger than us. Uh, so if scaling up, there's about 10 to 30 orders of magnitude. Uh, scaling down, it's about 10 to 30 orders of magnitude to the Planck scale. Yeah. Uh, now, at the Planck scale, if you could see the organization and the, the energy and information flux of things around you, everything would look exactly the same. It would be a high energy flux, uh, high, high energy density uh, system uh, everywhere. Even th th there would be no like space like free space, empty space, and material objects, uh, it would be a fluctuating field of energy. Uh, uh, multiple have, connected. If I'm correct, that wouldn't even be static. That would just be like a flat nothing. Because a static would still be too fast or too slow. It's too slow, I mean. But from the, like, I mean, that that that's essentially why people view space as flat, isn't it? Because from that far away, it looks like nothing's happening. Well, from our scale, yes, uh, that, that's that's why the scale is important to you because uh, from our scale, uh, the the you can't see the Planck scale. So, uh, and all that uh, flux, all that it, it fluctuation, energy fluctuation, uh, which is 
you know, um, particle antiparticle fluctuation, uh, positive negative charge fluctuation, uh, positive and negative space time curvature fluctuation. Mm -hmm. uh, at our scale, all of that fluctuation in most instances uh, balances to net zero. Yeah. Uh, so in most instances, space time looks flat, but uh, not everywhere, especially not around uh, the kind of gradients in that structure that we call like protons. There, space time is very much not flat. <laughs> I, and charge is very much not zero. Uh, you, you know, so th there are uh, uh, specific areas where uh, it doesn't, at our scale, balance out to exactly zero. Uh, but certainly, if you could get down to the Planck scale, uh, you would see constant dynamism, constant. Uh, energy fluctuations and uh, multiply connected space-time geometry forming uh, loops and uh, uh, multiple connections uh, uh, continuously. It would look like almost like a, a living fluctuating matrix. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, you know, at, at that scale, you don't have the clear delineation of identifying even singular objects because everything kind of becomes one thing. Yeah. Now at our scale though, d just like how that begins to appear like it has zero energy vacuum, uh, classical type vacuum state uh, and flat space time, uh, you know, we do at our scale, uh, e even though this awareness and energy and information flux is occurring through all things, even through empty, what we think of as empty space, which isn't empty, uh, we do though have uh, uh, identifiable systems that are distinct. Yes. And what makes them distinct is that even at this meso scale, they recapitulate that fundamental structure. Uh, they have an energetic gradient. Uh, so uh, at, at that fundamental uh, level of the, the Planck scale, uh, when you have an energetic gradient, uh, you have matter, you have a proton. Uh, in most other cases, it, it cancels out and you don't see any energy at all. Uh, now, in some systems, uh, even when you have a collection of trillions and trillions of protons, uh, that energy gradient is maintained. It's recapitulated. So it's a fractal reiteration at a larger scale. Feedback. Oh, uh, well, uh, with that energetic gradient this, that is established in those systems, mm -hmm. now they're and far from thermodynamic equilibrium. So they have a dynamic energy and information flux. It's going through the system. They're animated, they're dynamic systems. Uh, and so that distinguishes uh, a rabbit from a rock <laughs> is what, 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 what I'm getting at <laughs> uh, through, through the physics of it, you know? Uh, so, so why, if a, a rock has the same kind of uh, intrinsic awareness within it, uh, how come we don't say it's a living system? It's because that rock is at equilibrium. It's at thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have the uh, physical capabilities to exhibit goal-oriented behavior. Because uh, it just, it can't work with matter uh, and energy uh, to, to affect any kind of change. Uh, so the intrinsic awareness is there, you just, you can't see it. If it's there and it's at equilibrium, then it has no more needs. If it has no more needs, it has no goal oriented behavior. It doesn't, it doesn't have goals. I mean, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty, a pretty sweet. Uh, you know? <laughs> uh, it's a thermodynamic equilibrium, you know, uh, whereas systems though that are far from thermodynamic equilibrium, if they want to maintain that state, you have to work within uh, nature. Uh, you know, you have to uh, um, engineer matter and energy so that you can uh, perpetuate and maintain that far from thermodynamic equilibrium state because uh, the natural 
tendency is for systems to go to thermodynamic equilibrium. That's the lowest energy condition. Things in nature want to be in the lowest energy condition. Well, uh, there I'm using some anthropomorphic language, yeah. which isn't uh, exactly correct. It, it's not that they want to be in thermodynamic equilibrium. It's just the lowest energy yeah. state, so things gra gravitate towards that state. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that, that's a common language thing that I do all the time is anthropomorphize the universe, but I guess that's a good point. You, sh you probably shouldn't do it. It's not very yeah, good yeah. for you. <laughs> well, because, you know, one of the reasons the, uh, it, it was not great to use it there is because I was saying that you know, things in nature want to go to thermodynamic equilibrium, but actually I could make uh, just as good a argument that things want to go to far from thermodynamic equilibrium because there seems to be uh, an organizing principle, a drive, a trajectory for the uh, natural evolution of systems in the universe to go towards far from thermodynamic equilibrium uh, organizational states the ie that there seems to be a propensity a drive for the universe to form living systems yes uh, so so you know uh i i think as much as you could say systems in nature want to go to equilibrium some systems certainly want to go to far from thermodynamic equilibrium oh, so all, all the we're talking about here is whether something is on its way out of the core of the proton or working its way around or whether it's reinserting itself back into it so in this kind of sense it's like the two hemisphere idea where you know they're both going in the same direction but from one direction it looks one direction and from the other direction it looks the other direction from the external um and that's kind of what's then defined as left or right or up and down and, and relative reference point zones uh, constructed out of that. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and you know, you can also begin to bring in the the significance, the importance of uh, feedback, feed forward dynamics. So if you're talking about exactly. you know uh, uh, exchanges going out of the proton and in. To the proton, uh, you, th that that kind of uh, feedback feed forward organization is ex uh, s central, uh, very important to the kind of dynamics that are uh, correlated with awareness. The kind I just of information. Also... I just also realized I probably have made a big uh, boo-boo for a lot of people out there talking about something that goes out of a proton and back inside of it. That's kind of like a not something that happens in science in a general discussion is it <laughs> well yeah yeah no yeah, so well. certainly certainly if uh there are some traditional uh orthodox particle physicists <laughs> listening to, to that part of the discussion uh d they might even be a little bit angry you know on like dude the, what, what are these people talking about there's yeah. nothing that goes into an <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> Yeah, but but you know, just, just yeah, for, for their sake, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about we we have uh, uh, a solution that describes the quantum structure of the proton, a uh, space-time quantum structure, uh, and one of the uh, elements of that solution that uh, correctly outputs the mass of the proton uh, and its size uh, is, and it's uh, the the confinement forces, uh, the strong force. Uh, the the um, residual strong force, uh, the the uh, nuclear confinement forces in that, that way. Uh, w one of the elements of th that solution is that uh, the protons uh, actually have a uh, geometry of space time uh, that connects the inside uh, with other protons uh, and with uh, systems outside of the proton, uh, so that you do have. Uh, information and energy flux into and out of a proton. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you, you know, um, it's just that it's kind of uh, an unfortunate circumstance, I believe, that, uh, you know, modern uh, particle physics uh, is divorced from some of the historical approaches like quantum geometrodynamics. Uh, so if you look at... Uh, Wheeler's quantum geometric dynamics. Uh, there's something called the Wheeler wormhole, uh, where your uh, particle-antiparticle pair 
is actually a space-time configuration uh, that's called an Einstein-Rosen bridge, or more popularly, a wormhole. Uh, so actually, it, there you go. You know? uh, now, if, if you had uh, uh, the, the uh, connection point between those two sheets uh, yeah. in, in uh, Einstein-Rosen uh, geometry and in Wheeler's quantum geometrodynamics, that is a particle. Yes, a particle antiparticle pair. So you know, there's uh, it, it, it exchanges coming into and out of uh, particles. Now, uh, w one quick thing about that Schrodinger quote uh, yes. that you shared. Uh, you know, it, I think that it's it's a, a profound thing to uh, highlight uh, because you know one of the things that he was pointing out is that uh, within orthodox science, traditional scientific thought, uh, it's formulated in such a way that we believe that uh, there are fundamental laws of nature, and these laws of nature are immutable and inerrant, and they 100% determine the outcomes of all events. Uh, so, you know, th this is sometimes called like New Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian type determinism. Uh, and in most scientists and even in most uh, non-technical, non-scientist type persons, uh, th this is an underlying philosophy that is almost kind of inculcated, uh, a kind of like uh, a determinism of uh, Newtonian type mechanics. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, Schrodinger was pointing out is that in considerations of consciousness, uh, Newtonian mechanics and determinism is violated. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, when you're talk, beginning to talk about a science of consciousness, uh, which is a key characteristic of life and living things, uh, you no longer have uh, the kind of uh, inerrant, immutable determinism that, say, particle physicists like to work with, yes. where, you know, um, in a classical system, if you have the positions and velocities of all particles in a room, you can predict their behavior out to infinity. Yes. And you can infer their history out to the beginning of infinity. <laughs> uh, you, you know, but, uh, you know, obviously in, in quantum mechanics, there is intrinsic indeterminism, but not everybody actually has that as an operable philosophy in mind, this intrinsic indeterminism of quantum mechanics. Uh, but what Schrodinger was pointing out is that, you know, when you move your hand, that is an in, in, in intrinsic volition. Yeah. Uh, th and, you know, he's saying, in my experience, that is not due to the immutable laws of physics <laughs> uh, determining at which point and in which way, at which point in time and in which way I'll move my arm. I'm the agent, I'm the awareness behind the volition to move my arm. And when I have that volition, the atoms that make up my arm, that make up my skeletal muscular system, that make up the nerves that innervate my skeletal muscular system, the atoms that comprise that system respond to my awareness, my consciousness. You know, uh, so, so if we're going to play the game of what's more ontologically primitive, what's more ontologically fundamental. Uh, you know, it's not, in this case scenario, what Schrodinger is pointing out, it's not the laws of physics. It's not particle physics. Uh, the particle physics are responding to awareness and consciousness. This is brilliant because this touches on that other aspect, which is the belief part to it. And, and what most people don't think of, I, I come at things from, a, FYI, um, I started in and, you know, qualified myself in community services and helping people and uh, lifting societies and communities in terms of their quality of living and standard of living. Um, and then from there, I've kind of gone off into all sorts of different branches of psychology, social sciences and other things like that, right down into um, esoteric studies like uh, Zen Buddhism um, and other things like that in order to create an understanding of what is our equilibrium that drives us towards happiness. You know, what, what is happiness and all this sort of stuff? How can I help people is always my driving force. But 
when we're talking about the belief of things and stuff like that, this is a discussion I, I really enjoy having is the free will discussion. Uh, but mostly because I think a lot of people out there uh, don't labor under the idea that there's multiple things that are going on up here. And that's, that's a dangerous world for some people. The idea that there's multiple things up here instantly means oh, I'm insane. You better take me away, you know, but no, actually we have like what is taught in meditative practices like Zen Buddhism and other practices similar, um, that you have a brain and you have you and you're witnessing what your brain does. So in this kind of understanding, it backs up this concept that you are not programmable or dictatable by the laws of physics or the laws of nature. You certainly have restrictions based on some laws of understanding nature, but it's not like the laws of nature impact what you decide to do. You still get that free will choice. But then there's another part of you that is ready to react based on those programs that you've been collecting and inputting into the experience of what we call memory and past pattern past experience that then comes out subconsciously as that pre-offered uh, opportunity to talk about or to gain more information about whatever that situation is that you're encountering in your experience. So the multiple concept there really, I think, helps a lot of people understand that, yeah, well, they do have a level of not free will. That's only a tiny part of the piece. There's a much larger part of the piece and it's usually hiding behind that part. So that's usually all you see is your determinism and how you have a certain limitation on what you think or how you think or how long it takes a thought to process across the neurons and go through the chemical exchanges of um, you know, the entire system from the top of the brain to the bottom of the body. You know, it's, it's fascinating those types of discussions especially when you think about what a living system is like. Yeah. And, and to a, a, a large extent, what the practice of like Zen Buddhism is, is to uh, identify those programs yeah. and overcome them. Yeah. Uh, and, and to a large extent, that's what, it, uh, you know, increasing consciousness, increasing awareness, self-awareness certainly is all about. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's uh, such a key distinction you know is that um okay so yeah you you have as you were so wonderfully describing there you know you've got your brain which uh that's operating perhaps via some you know newtonian type mechanics uh, uh or, or let, let's say deterministic physics since you know we know that uh, uh classical mechanics is now supplanted by quantum mechanics, which has a certain degree of uh, intrinsic indeterminism. Uh, but you know, there, there is though a certain degree of determinism on how the brain is operating because, uh, you know, when it's sending an electrical impulse, that process is kind of restricted in what it can do by the laws of physics. Uh, you, you know, uh, how quickly can an electrochemical impulse propagate along a neuronal membrane? You know, th th those are kind of deterministic type things. Uh, but, you know, one of the most salient points here is that your consciousness is not your brain. Uh, you know, and it, yeah, and this is another part where, you know, uh, we are diverging from the orthodox approach to consciousness science, which is the neurocomputational model, which 100% says that consciousness <laughs> is the brain. Uh, but, you, you know, uh, consciousness uh, is not the brain. So al although there, there is some determinism on how it's operating and it's adhering to some of the, the physics, the brain, your consciousness is something that's uh, greater and beyond uh, just the, the boundaries, the confines of the brain and the processes that are occurring in the brain. Uh, consciousness is something that occurs at a more fundamental level, at yeah. a more universal scale than just the brain. Uh, so, so uh, you know, in, in terms of like considerations of free will, your awareness trumps any kind of determinism from physical laws that are operational in the brain uh, or, or even, you know, programming from culture, society, or genes, or awareness. Otherwise we'd be a robot. We'd just be following yeah, exactly. programmed responses. 
you but you know there there is uh arguments in consciousness science that humans are robots you know yeah, I know. uh yeah <laughs> you know that there is some people out there who don't even see it as a question you know <sighs> that it's a potential no 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 that's just an illusion of your mind you're not actually there you're just a, a figment of your imagination it's like yeah to some degree but clearly we're all here you know <laughs> we're doing it doing whatever this is now oh, there was there was some interesting points i want to bring us back to in relation to the paper um that we touched on in the last uh faculty in the international space federation um faculty q a that you have once a month ISF. ISF, uh, which can be signed up for through the isf website definitely recommended for everybody out there these guys are piloting a direction for humanity that goes a lot further than let's blow shit up, you know, which is general scientific approach on things. But um, more to the point, I wanted to touch on some of the things that we were talking about in that, in how it ties in with the paper here from the last um, faculty. And that was the idea that if I understand everything that we've been talking about in relation to the paper and consciousness so far, Inez and, and yourself were very clearly pointing out that between if you, well, before we jump directly into that, in the standard computational model, the idea of processing of the human brain and what it's possible in its capacity to do is kind of set by this understanding or a potential that has never really been refuted that has since become the understanding due to the age of it, I guess. Um, that a single neuron is one bit of data or a single neuron handles one concept or one idea or one phenomenon or one point at a time where we now have plenty of evidence out there to show that not only neurons fire off many things at once but the dendrites themselves are acting as processes so it's not just the units i.e the neurons, but it's also the super freeways between them, the cables or the, the data flows between them, which we would usually consider to be roads. But it's almost like we're looking at a map of the human brain with all the roads spread out and you can't see anything. It just looks like roads. But as you start zooming in to all these roads, there's now cities that are popping up all along this map. Whereas before all that we could see was the megatropolises, which are the neurons. But instead of them being one city, one city, one city, you've got one city with potentially God knows how many options that come out of that one city. And then you've got these structures that flow in between these giant structures of single neurons that are not just data transfer cords or cables that are actually processing and, and changing. Can you talk about what our new understanding of since this idea that a neuron is one bit of data? Yeah, well, uh, I'm so glad you, you brought up that point because, uh, you know, that is, I believe, one of the most readily identifiable errors or even uh, deficits of the neural computational model. Yeah. Uh, is that it has this extremely simplistic model of uh, one synapse, one bit. Mm. Uh, and we, we know now, uh, 100%, uh, from, you know, empirical studies, observations, uh, that, uh, one synapse, uh, is not one bit. Mm. Uh, you, you know, so, uh, trying to equate a synapse to a digital binary on off type state, uh, is just factually in error. It, you, you know, it's this, that's not how a synapse functions, uh, biologically or even in informational processing capacity. Uh, it's not a digital binary on off state. Uh, you know, now we have like a hundred trillion synaptic connections uh, in the brain, uh, you, you, uh, you know, uh, and actually, I saw a study that came out this month, uh, the end of June, that said that scientists uh, have identified at least 10 times as much uh, connective 
uh, uh, network capacity uh, for each synapse. So actually, uh, if it's 100 trillion, that's uh, going to now be um, uh, 10 uh, quadrillion yeah. <laughs> synaptic connections because uh, what the the um, naive estimate uh, has been updated that it's actually uh, ten times greater the amount of connections. But I mean, all those points you brought up are, are just right on because uh, for one thing, uh, you know, uh, each neuron uh, has uh, multiple uh, dendritic connections. Uh, you know, uh, up to uh, uh, ten thousand connections for like a pyramidal neuron uh the uh you, you've got uh, dendritic spines that are continuously uh forming and reshaping uh the neuronal connection so neuronal plasticity there uh the synapse itself uh is not an on off state uh the the synapse itself uh has uh, uh gated uh reaction potentials uh, so it, it can um uh, occur along a gradient of responses. Uh, so, you know, it's not as, as simple as 100% um, uh, sending the signal and 100% not sending the signal. It can actually integrate uh, multiple inputs and uh, have modulated responses. Uh, so it's not a bit, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the synapse. Uh, so uh, what we have is that this idea that the brain, the neuron, is functioning like a computer, a digital computer, is wrong. Uh, that's not how the brain works. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, you can model some neuronal networks uh, in that way. Uh, and th there are some very simplistic neuronal networks within the brain that do work almost like in a computational type manner. Uh, but the way that the brain is processing information is unlike any technology that we currently can engineer. It's it's more advanced than any uh, information processing technology that we can currently uh, create. That's brilliant so, how you're putting that out in the big questions course, how we tend to think uh, of reality through our stage of technology and what yeah. we're talking about there is we, we use computers as an analogy just for everybody out there because that's about the, as high as we can think. So we're just basically saying this is as high as we can think. We think it's probably about that or more. Uh, uh, you know, w w when uh, the greatest level of techno technological sophistication was a steam engine back in the 19th century, uh, everything worked like a steam engine. You know, I mean, uh, there, there, there was uh, scientists who were discussing how the brain and uh, neuronal uh, 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 signaling could work uh, via like pressure and principles of, of hydraulics yeah. and th things pertaining to the technology of that era. Uh, and that's also where we have like remnants even today of the heat death, the entropic heat death of the universe, which is totally bunk, totally absurd. There was some amazing autonomous, 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 however many autonomous in the middle of that. Uh, somewhere in the early turn of the 1900s, there was some amazing ones out there that were probably working on similar concepts of how they could get the robot to function. And they're all hydraulically done, of course, none of them are electric. That's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, it, it's just that, like, our greatest technological sophistication today is a computer. So it's like, whoa, this must be how the brain works, you know? Uh, and it's just, it's, it's not uh, how the brain works. I mean, even one, I think, uh, example, that, that it's a great, uh, I, th I think a great illustration of this is, uh, it's called a fat, a faptic signaling. Uh, so um, what you can have is, so say you have two neurons side by side, uh, and one of the neurons is uh, sending a signal, uh, you know, it's receiving electrical inputs and it's sending an electrical chemical impulse uh, down its axon to the, the, the dendrites and the synapses, that, the, the axon terminal. Uh, what you can have is as that electrical signal propagates, it sends out an electrical field in a spherical radial manner uh, and it 
is incident upon a neighboring neuron and uh, that electrical field causes that neuron to fire. Uh, so those neurons actually don't, let's say, ha even necessarily have a direct synaptic connection uh, and they're really? influencing each other's behavior. Uh -huh. uh, and so one of the things that you can have occurring is as these neurons are firing, it's not just the, the relay, the linear relay of messages, but also this like uh, global wave pattern that's yeah. being established fr from the uh, electrical, electromagnetic fields emanating from each uh, uh, neuron that influence the activity of neurons in the network and in, in, in the global space. Uh, you get these global wave interference patterns it's like a holographic information processing system. That's an interesting point because that's not something that many people might pick up on is that neurons that fire together aren't necessarily wired together. Precisely. That's, precisely. That's cool. And, and now, you know, so the, we're, we're kind of going up against the mainstream, the orthodox here. So there would yeah. be pushback, <laughs> right? Uh, but if you look at, some of the, the top neuroscientists, or one in particular, um, he has developed brain machine interface devices that has, for instance, enabled paraplegics to walk yeah. uh, using this model. Uh, you know, he, he says that, okay. Uh, like, okay, the traditional neurocomputational model is that digital bit, that binary unit of uh, neuron to neuron wired together signaling. Uh, but, you know, th that's like a discrete micro scale level activity that's important. But the main uh, action is at a global level, yeah. the spatiotemporal evolving electromagnetic field patterns uh, that arise from the, the, these uh, global wave interference uh, patterns that are generated by brain activity. Uh, and so this this neuroscientist, uh, that's his underlying model. He actually calls the brain a space-time engine uh, because he, he's thinking about it in terms of like uh, its uh, evolution of this, this uh, electromagnetic field pattern through time and space. Yeah. Uh, so he had developed a brain-to-machine interface device that you just, you know, put it all over the uh, cranium, uh, it reads those electromagnetic field patterns and uh, paraplegics can get like an exoskeleton to get them to walk, uh, send signals. I play around with a mini EEG machine headband and have oh, nice. yeah. the programming language for that and like how to control video games using your brainwaves and stuff like that. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard of that guy, I can't remember his name. Was he, yeah. was he the one that had the young boy at the Brazilian? Um... Exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, for some reason, uh, my brain wants to say Kurzweil, <laughs> but it's not uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, that the, the Brain is a uh, technology that, that is far advanced beyond anything we have today. Uh, you know, uh, we are starting to see, I think, some of the beginnings of the kind of technology that is more akin to how the brain is op operating. And it's actually more akin to how information is processed in natural systems at a fundamental level in the universe. And what you have in that case scenario is not binary digital type com computations it's not programs it's not algorithms uh not not even necessarily what, uh memory although it, it can it, it appears as memory uh that's yeah. why we uh talk about space memory the space memory network we got uh, there very shortly uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know more uh fundamentally it's um uh, instantaneous accession of information it's not even processing information it's not even encoding and storing information uh in many instances it's that uh you have this multiverse that's connected via multiply connected space-time geometry and there is information in quantum information and energy flux through that entire network that entire system uh and 
if you have a query uh, that you want computed to calculate an answer, uh, you know, what we do with our technology is set up an algorithm, uh, they, a program that can compute and output a number, and that's information processing and it requires memory and data processing and energy and all that. Uh, what the universe does is it says, okay, I have this multiverse and a multi-connected geometry, space-time geometry. Uh, this multiverse already has the answer to that question. We don't need to do any information processing, any, uh, we don't need bits or, or binary data or anything. Uh, we'll just tap into the network, the multiply connected space-time geometry network, go to that multiverse, uh, that universe where the answer is there, retrieve the, the information, you have it instantaneously. Uh, so instantaneous accession of information. Okay. That is the ultimate, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. That, that, that's the ultimate form of, information processing processing technology is just instantly knowing what you need to know when you need to know it is that possibly uh, have you looked into or heard of the d-wave quantum computer oh uh well the D deep wave i mean that's a, a quantum computer yeah, yeah. that's yeah, basically yeah. what that's basically what the ceo was talking about was the ability yeah. for the d-wave quantum computer instead of having on and off states to put itself into a state, like a third state that cross references different dimensions where the information is and to then pull a copy of that back. Um, yeah. He uses words like exploit other dimensions. And I don't know if that's um, something that is a good thing, but <laughs> copying <laughs> from somewhere else might be a good idea, but taking it from somewhere else might start a war. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 prefer, I prefer the term accession, you're, you're accessing it, you know, it's like, you're not necessarily like perturbing it, or, you know, changing it or taking it, you're just taking a look at it. <laughs> Good point. Accession. I like that. Um, no. in, in regards to the memory, the, I think that, okay, so we Obviously, a living system is alive. Obviously, that's different from a rock or something that's what we would usually consider to be dead. Now, science without the ability, because of its own setting its own definitions, and part of it setting its own definitions was there's no such thing as a soul or anything that can't be touched, tasted, seen, smelt, or heard, that anything beyond that isn't included in our answers. So then when it's come down to trying to identify what the difference is between a living state and a dead state, without that being already excluded from the discussion, prevents us from being able to find a solution. But everybody out there in the general world outside of the scientific community is aware of the fact that they're alive and that other things are dead and that other things are alive around them. So everybody kind of has this understanding of this internal thing that's coming out of it that we're talking about, even if they don't know the full context of certain words or terms that we've been using. Still, everybody also has a direct experience of the past and has this thing that we call memory. Now, the ISF works under the premise that space time is actually more analogous to something that we might call space memory which is this multiple integrated wormhole network that underlies everything that you were just talking about. So it can exchange information from one side of the universe to the other at super liminal speeds, like beyond, beyond the speed of light. It makes the speed of light look like a <laughs> snail's pace or a Sunday stroll yeah. even. Um, so when we're talking about memory and the quantum computer analogy, I find this very interesting because we've got, okay, so let's do it in the present moment and then we'll extend it into the past like that. But if we look at the present moment where we've got time and space in our reality and we just flatten it down to a, a tablet for easy example, but you've got this tablet analogy of you and this William Brown has his particular parts and pieces and they're all the variations within the circuit or the addresses of that circuit. Now this on the front of it without opening William up has a certain address to it or a certain descriptive factor that could be described as an address. What we're talking about here or what we're starting to talk about is also blockchain. Mm -hmm. So before we get much further, very quickly, do you find it interesting that even though computers are what we were using and that's now kind of got, well, yeah, we've been dealing with computers for a while, but 
blockchain is a new form of technology. Is it any coincidence that we happen to have the, both of these things arising at the same time? Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's a really interesting observation there mm. uh, because, you know, one of the aspects of blockchain technology is that in a certain sense, uh, you know, it's a holographic information storage system. Uh, and in that way, it's uh, decentralized. You know, so um, if you had one area of the blockchain that is destroyed or lost, uh, the addresses and the information uh, is accessible in other uh, areas of the blockchain. Uh, you know, so, so uh, that's actually very analogous to the how the brain works in its holographic information processing system uh, structure. Uh, now, uh, but you, so you were saying though, that at the same time that we have the blockchain arising, what, what was the other? Well, if, if that's just like a, a image of what's going on at the present moment, then if we correlate this into the past and uh, as, as we're not a being moving through time, but we're uh, reality creating instances in time and experiencing those instances, then I've got William here as this tablet and then another William, another William extending back into the past until that's then baby William, which then becomes mum, mum, whatever your mum's name is. <laughs> and uh, beyond that, right? So when you're correlating your memory with your present experience, when you're recalling your memory to your present experience, you're uh, creating a match between your current um, face configuration with your previous configuration and then opening up a wormhole connection and, and correlating, uh, sending information back and forth through the both of them. So in a way, we might say that the um, neural network exchanging all this information and the frequencies of these waves that are creating um, gestalt-like patterns as a overall arcing, arching concept above these minute details that are going on. These gestalt patterns might be the addresses that I was mentioning. If you match your address from this point in time with the memory that you're looking for back in this particular point in time, that's more likely to facilitate, if, in my understanding, a better memory, what we would call a stronger memory than what it would be if you had less connections between this point in time and the part that you were trying to remember. Are we on the right path here? Yeah, you know, I think that that is a useful way to conceptualize it. Uh, but, you know, when we start to get more into the fundamental dynamics of what is occurring, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, and uh, we actually have to be careful on how we're conceptualizing uh, what the memory function is of space. Yes. Yeah, uh, because, you know, uh, it appears as a memory function, uh, as a, a memory property. Uh, but that is at best a loose reference to what is actually occurring. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so in, in the same way that the memory, uh, uh, the memory property of space appears to us as time, as a temporal dimensionality, uh, you know, we know that actually that time is illusionary. Uh, and what's occurring at a more fundamental level is that there is memory information encoding information storage in space, in the structure of space. Uh, one of the reasons why we know that time is illusionary uh, and in that sense is, is emergent. Uh, and so although we have this like tangible, almost visceral experience of time we know it's it's uh illusionary is that when you look at like quantum mechanics you have uh total time symmetry 
uh, with uh, quantum mechanical processes, they look exactly the same. Uh, they have the same laws of physics uh, if you run them forwards in time or if you run them backwards in time. Uh, however, it is that you're actually arbitrarily defining forwards and backwards in those uh, uh, quantum systems, which actually don't really have a, a, a temporal directionality. Uh, electromagnetism. Uh, there are the solutions to ele electromagnetism. Uh, anytime you have a photon that is emitted, uh, that is simultaneously, instantaneously occurring with uh, of the same photon coming from the future and being absorbed. Yeah. Uh, so you have retarded solutions to the elect, uh, Maxwell's electromagnetic solutions, and you have advanced solutions. Uh, retarded waves are what we normally observe in what appear to go forward in time, uh, but they're always coupled with uh, advanced waves that are coming from the future uh, and being absorbed at the same instant that the retarded waves are being emitted. Yeah. Uh, and so actually, uh, you only ever have a photon emitted uh, if it already has uh, the place where it's going to be absorbed. <laughs> it, so it, for, for a quanta to be emitted, it has to uh, communicate with a future state uh, to agree upon an emission and absorption. Uh, Wheeler uh, and Feynman called this the, the quantum handshake. Yes. Uh, the, these quanta reach across time and they they shake hands and they say you emit all absorb and vice versa. Uh, Einstein's general relativity uh, you have the block universe, uh, and in the block universe uh, you have the relativity of simultaneity. So uh, you can't say one hundred percent that uh, two events occur simultaneously uh, because it actually is relative to the frame of reference. So if you have a, a in one frame a bolt of lightning strike in, in two other frames, A and B, uh, you ask them, when did that, what time on your watch did that bolt of lightning strike? Depending on how they're moving and what gravitational field they're in, they'll give you two different times for that lightning strike. Uh, and general relativity, because of the relativity of simultaneity, will say they're both right because time is relative to their frame of reference. And that's because time is illusionary it's it's a, a secondary characteristic and the more fundamental characteristic is the the relationship of information uh, between those reference frames between the past and the future emitter and absorber uh the the evolution of the uh uh superposition of the wave function yeah now uh so uh what that equates to is that uh, you know, your present moment is occurring concordantly, simultaneously, instantaneously with every other reference frame, every other time, space, space, time uh, con coordinate. Uh, so, you know, even to uh, begin to, to linearize our history, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we already are getting into trouble, you know, uh, right. so it because you know if it's valid to to consider it as memory but if anything that memory uh is being formed right now due to the wave input the holographic wave interference input from everything else in the universe every other space-time coordinate uh incident on your current space-time coordinate right now uh, spatial coordinate uh and so that in a way the memory is always being generated right now <laughs> in this moment um you, you know but it, it, it's just that when we look at the information uh you know it looks like it's defining a past uh and then a current state that's going to take us to a, a future system but mechanistically that's not actually how uh it's working and in fact, you can change conditions now to to change which past history it links to. Yeah. Certainly, which future trajectory it links to. Yeah. But it also depends on what memory that we're talking about as well. Mm -hmm. What type mm -hmm. of memory. Yeah. And and for the sake of conversation, um, it's usually those ones that we consider to be what happened to us in the past, like my recollection of yesterday's past events, as opposed to 
my memory of how to feed myself or how to wipe my bits and pieces. But the these subjective memories that we have, these experiential memories that we have, are just correlating information, making that cross time handshake with a past connection, and then describing these correlative space time reference frames, and then telling the story between those two. Is that more correct? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, that is a, I, I would say, fairly precise description of, of how we uh, envision the kind of uh, uh, memory that is forming our story or our, our uh, narrative of the self uh, the so so our subjective uh, experience yeah. um, and you know so you know you can actually start to consider you know how you know the, the mechanics of that plays into our experiences of you know, re remembering uh, our past, our past histories, yeah. um, you know, so uh, the degree of the strength of space-time connection, uh, the, the ge ge geometry connection of a space determines, uh, you know, how uh, f the, the fidelity of recall of the, the past state. Uh, so, that's one of the reasons why like memory begins to fade over time uh, is that actually you're forming more and more connections uh, as you're undergoing your time evolution. Uh, so as uh, your space information configuration uh, is actually growing and that correlates with progression into a forward time direction. Uh, that's a paper we're working on right now. It's, it's called uh, the, the arrow of time emergent from increasing entanglement information or entanglement entropy. Entropy relates to information. Um, so one of the things that defines a directionality to time uh, is increasing connections, increasing connectivity. Uh, why you seem to have future states and past states is that future states have much higher connection density, uh, uh, qubit connect connectivity density, wormhole qubit connectivity density uh, than, than past states. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why memory like seems to kind of fade. Uh, so uh, you're forming more and more connections. So like, let's say that the information from a previous space coordinate, space-time coordinate, uh, it has more and more circuitous network paths, more and more reference frames that it has to travel to uh, before it gets uh, to your location. Uh, so, you know, um, it, you can actually start to describe some of the mechanics of memory. Uh, well, so some of the mechanics of the, the underlying system of, of memory that leads to our experience of, uh, you, you know, things like memory fading or having a crystal clear memory of a particular event. It's like there's a very strong connection, very strong uh, uh, direct qubit wormhole connection to that event. I always imagined it to be something similar to that because um, you, you definitely seem to have Alzheimer's and old people is a very interesting one um, to witness and experience with um, how they forget their memory, but given the right stimuli, it'll snap back instantly and seemingly more rich than what it is in their present moment for them in some instances. But then this is the reason why I started with the uh, talking about the, the tablet concept and then the um, the blockchain because what we're talking about when we move away from ourselves we start losing our memory like that if i understand correctly is forgetting the um blockchain links you know so the is it fukunawa or yukinawa potential that graph the curve graph there you, know, you might yukawa. Have, yukawa you might have something yukawa. similar to that or, or like a, a somatic pattern in geometry or something like how things aren't having much luck and things aren't making any connections and then it kind of starts to and then it very quickly makes a 
delineation towards its result. But that's because we've crossed the threshold of say 95% recognition or 95% of the, the time passcode between our present moment and recollecting this past experience, whether that was 80 years ago or yesterday. Um, but the, the, the reference points to open up the micro scale wormhole connections to feed information back and forward between the two points in time are falling apart due to the distance that they're coming apart. That's not due to the distance as in like they're starting to twang, twang, twang and strap and pull apart, but that's due to our inability to recollect those bits and pieces. Well, it's and you can, almost in a way. You, you can identify uh, some the physical correlates of those connections in the brain. Uh, so it's uh, v very likely that uh, those connections, uh, you, you know, if you even think about it as like the, the uh, blockchain addresses on yeah. each uh, tablet, uh, that, that that address is being stored in the microtubules of the neuron. Yeah. Uh, so what we believe is occurring is that uh, within the microtubules, uh, you actually have the kind of quantum states uh, that, uh, like um, uh, a quantum superposition type state, um, it, it involves the uh, delocalized electron orbitals of aromatic amino acids in the tubulin residues of microtubules. Uh, but the, 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 these uh, quantum structures within the microtubule uh, are what are actually forming the wormhole connection, the Einstein-Rosen bridge connection across these space-time coordinates. Uh, and so, uh, you, you know, the, in terms of like a physical repository of the address of the blockchain, it's it's uh, being recorded in the microtubules uh, in those qubit wormhole states. Uh, you know, uh, uh, like a, uh, I'm using the terminology of like a quantum bit, yeah. uh, just that, but more in the sense of what you were mentioning with like the deep wave system, the D yeah. computer, uh, just that, uh, you know, it's it's uh, a kind of q a quantum state, a bit of information that can access parallel <laughs> universes, uh, you know. Well, uh, very quick question on the microtubule, that kind of makes me wonder if a single microtubule is a single tube or whether a single microtubule might be a, 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 a traffic connection point center like does a microtubule with its blockchain at the entrance to use the current analogy does that then dictate that it's going to go to one place or does this one microtubule potential have potentially have many outputs well you know i i wonder though uh, if you you have a, a you know a complete picture of what the microtubule looks like in the neuron. So uh, w within the neuron, you you have a, a core filamentary bundle. Yeah. Uh, so the the microtubules uh, in a neuron are are different than in most other cells, in that uh, they form this scaffolding uh, that is fairly uh, stable. Uh, unchanging. Um, so, you know, from soma neuronal cell body uh, down the axon to the axon I terminal. I think I'm thinking more directly of a carbon nanotube. Huh, huh. Yeah. Well, you know, now it's just so, you know, th those those microtubules in like the, the axon filament, uh, they are uh, traffic highways. Uh, you, you you use that term, uh, but you know that that's partly because uh, you you have these things called uh, these molecular motors called uh, uh, dynein and kinesin uh, that that actually transport vesicles cargo along the microtubules and they they walk along yes. the microtubules. You know. Yeah, I know uh, Yeah, yeah, but but uh, you, you know. It, uh, in terms of the, the kind of information processing, um, it's uh, 
the, the, the core filamentary microtubule bundle is connected to the axonal membrane via these intermediate filaments. Uh, uh, it's called a beta spectrum actin uh, inter fil intermediate filament network. Uh, so when you have those kind of uh, electrical and uh, effaptic electromagnetic signals incident on a neuron in the neuronal axon, those uh, electrical signals are being uh, transmitted to the, the core microtubule filamentary bundle and vice versa. Gotcha. Uh, and that's changing the uh, uh, information state of the informational subunits in the microtubule. Those uh, ch changing informational states, uh, they, they are quantum states. They have a Einstein-Rosen bridge uh, space-time geometry. Uh, and so, so like, just as an example, when you start to get, like, Alzheimer's, where memory is being wiped out, what you can see inside the neuron is that uh, those that micro, those microtubules, the microtubule core uh, filamentary structure uh, is uh, falling apart. Oh. Uh, and you get things, uh, it's called like uh, tau fibrils, uh, that, that is kind of like just chaotic uh, structure that is just the, the microtubules falling apart. And it, so it's kind of like the, those uh, the, those blockchain addresses are just being deleted exactly. uh, one after the other. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it is an interesting situation because it's uh, is an example, though, of why, you know, you are not your brain is that, okay, so... You know, uh, in the operational, in your operational memory, if you're under experiencing Alzheimer's, uh, you know, you, you're going to lose resolution, uh, lose memory, uh, a lot of cognitive type function as that disintegration is occurring. But, you know, uh, at, at, you know, the, the in the last moments, uh, Alzheimer's uh, patients, uh, al people who are succumbing to Alzheimer's can have absolute lucidity yeah. uh, and re recall their entire life history and so you know before you know there's a relative that they didn't even recognize all of a sudden it's they have complete recognition complete remembering of everything about that person and it's just that you know uh there is a deeper level uh information storage to, to you to your story than just the physical brain uh i i, I just uh should make that Point. I, I think uh, just to remind people that you know uh, your, your consciousness is not your brain, even though we can talk about structures and, and uh, mechanisms that correlate with your consciousness in the brain. Anybody out there who's listened to me for any period of time knows that I'm a I'm one who is always talking about the fact that you are not your brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> this also, but because of my confusion there over thinking that I looked at nanotubes over here and that they would be the same over here simple misunderstandings like that can happen a lot so i want to back up a little bit we were talking about neurons and there's a lot of research nowadays talking about neurons of the heart neurons of the gut are we talking about extended neurons or are we just talking about neurons found within the brain okay uh, and i i got to uh caution that um I'm actually at about the end of my time, uh, so I yeah, I, 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 I might have to take this as as the last question. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, so I have primarily been uh, talking about uh, considering neurons in the brain uh, in the central nervous system, uh, but that's a really good point uh, that you know uh, there are neurons uh, in the heart. Uh, neurons uh, all, all through the uh, skeletal muscular system, uh, innervation uh, in the gut. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, you know, only considering neur neurons in the brain is uh, focusing on just a, a small part of the larger uh, uh, information processing uh, system, neuronal system of the body. Uh, so, but one of the things is that I think there are some uh, differences in, let's say, the, the neurons of the heart and how they function as compared to uh, neurons in the brain. Uh, and one of those uh, you could even potentially see in the uh, subcellular structure and like the microtubule structure. Uh, so like neurons in the heart, for example, uh, are going to have a much greater mitochondrial density. 
a higher number of mitochondria. There's still a high number in the neurons in the brain, especially uh, at the synapse. The synapse is packed with mitochondria. Uh, but uh, with the brain in most regions, oftentimes the kind of information processing that is occurring is to transmit that information to the microtubules for long-term storage yeah. and access the information that's in that long-term storage. The heart, the neurons like uh, in the heart, uh, in even the, the heart cells that are uh, uh, working together with the neurons uh, that aren't having that type of behavior. That's not their spe specialization. Uh, you know, it's much more uh, uh, a fluid information flow information flow in the moment uh so you know it's uh, not s uh, storing information for like long-term type memory really yeah 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 so you know um it's one of the reasons though that if you can shift your thinking <laughs> and this can be done and, and i know this is going to sound crazy to the, the those in the, the uh traditional neurocomputational model because they think that everything is occurring in the brain but if you can shift your thinking to the heart uh you actually vastly expand your receptivity yeah. and awareness uh because in the brain the information all of it its main purpose and function is to, to process that information through that core memory structure the the, the, the microtubule filament structure and also uh, D, dna to a certain extent um so everything's being received and filtered through that uh which is not as rapid dynamic and expansive as the the more in the moment fluid information exchange that is uh, the information processing occurring in the heart and the inf and information is being processed like in the heart it's being processed in the gut uh your, your body it's it, it's not your consciousness is not your brain you know uh it's your, your whole body and uh you know, if you can shift your thinking and awareness to your heart, you will have a different experience of reality. But that's more so just because uh, your awareness is uh, more receptive and in many ways richer, uh, yeah. more expansive. That's that's absolutely beautiful for us to finish on that. that everything that we're talking about just now is generally what I spend my time talking to other people about it and working with you know, work with people is helping them see how simple connections between how they relate to themselves can help them overcome problems that they previously thought were unachievable um, by you know simple things like understanding how they work you know because a lot of the time we put up roadblocks and we create problems within ourselves because we've been given a cookie that's a bad cookie uh, not as, as in a food thing, I mean that as a concept or an idea, like that, you know, at the age 40, you'll start breaking down. That's inevitable and you're always going to die. And, you know, it, 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 it always is inevitable. But there's also these ideas that, like you're saying, we set up and, and govern parts of our biology based upon how we direct our thought and what parts of that biology we activate or don't activate which extends out into other parts and places in time through that handshake that you were talking about, plus the infinite micro hole, uh, the infinite micro wormhole network, the informational nexus of awareness, and um, how that then comes out to be expressed through the individual as life. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer my crazy, crazy, crazy questions. And uh, Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant questions. <laughs> it, well, it, was, it was a pleasure. Uh, I, I'm interviewing them. Much yeah. enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, good, good to hear. Um, I hope that we get to do this again soon. Um, we'll be in more conversation about that as we move forward. But yeah, I'll let you get back to your world. Uh, I was hoping that we would get everything I wanted done, and that was that literally was the last question that I had. I skipped oh, wow. that one, but I thought we should go back to it, and there we go. Good deal. Good so deal, yeah. Perfect. Oh, well, uh, I uh, very much enjoyed uh, the discussion. So uh, th thank you for uh, having me on and uh, for the very insightful, brilliant questions. Uh, it, was, it was great to get to explore some of these concepts with you.
Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Well, I'll send you a message when I've got it up on YouTube and um, it's all ready to go. Um, just in case you wanted to have a laugh at us while we're... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I'll let you get back to um, taking humanity off into space using um, gravitational techniques to... Yep. We, we've got the... Uh, uh, got to get back to some of this uh, engineering that we got going. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Mm. Thank you so much, William. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate you and your time and everything that you're doing for humanity out there. Like I've said to you a couple of times, I think that these are some very, very big, empirically big things for all of us at the moment. Thank well, you. Well, I, I definitely appreciate the, the interest and the recognition and the significance because uh, it's yeah. it's um, a way that you know you're, you're supporting our work. So it's uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Until next time. May the vacuum be with you. All right. Ciao. Ciao.